at some point as you get close to the 63rd Street car source, to start running towards that lot, right? Towards the fire that in the Duramax. And Mr. Rosenbaum is running ahead of you, isn't he? I don't, I don't believe so. But you decided you needed to run because of the fire on the Duramax? Yes. Why? What was so urgent? It was a fire. Why did you feel that you uh, should go around off the 59th Street car source property and put out fires? To make sure my community didn't get burnt down and help. And when you say your community, you mean Kenosha? Yes. Again, you're from Antioch. You're not living in Kenosha at this time when this all happens, right? My dad lives in Kenosha. <laughs> Judge, thanks a lot for coming on. What do you make of this? Well, I think that along with your with your last guest, J.D. Vance, what we're seeing here is the politicization of the criminal justice system. This is a case where clearly self-defense uh, is, is something that will exonerate Kyle Rittenhouse. And whether this case goes to the jury or whether the judge dismisses some of the charges on his own or whether the judge grants a mistrial, this young man will be uh, acquitted and exonerated. What has happened here is there was a rush to judgment in this case. This kid who was a, you know, a fire cadet, a lifeguard, and a police explorer, he was a kid who went there to clean graffiti, they have video of it. He went there to help people. He was a medic. He was CPR trained. And he finds himself in this situation. He's got a gun. And in every circumstance, he is, and it's corroborated by what the witnesses say. The, the prosecution star witness, the one who isn't dead, basically said, yes, I was lunging at him and I had a loaded gun and I was aiming at him. I mean, they established the case right there. As a judge, I would say, hey, come up to the sidebar here. What are we doing here, guys? But what you had was a rush to judgment in August of 2020. We are in the post-George Floyd world. Jacob Blake had just been shot. Everybody wanted to make sure that, you know, that everyone was prosecuted. This kid was prosecuted when the evidence was clear that he was de defending himself. Now, once the burden of proof has shifted, once he claims self-defense, the prosecution has to disprove that beyond a reasonable doubt. That's why the prosecution is desperate right now. They're on the ropes. The reason they're on the ropes is they cannot disprove beyond a reasonable doubt based on the drone, the video, the testimony of the prosecution star witness, and the incredibly Focused testimony of this young man. He may only be 18, but I'll tell you, in all the years I prosecuted myself and tried cases as a judge, this kid in every point never lost his cool. Sure, he cried. He never got angry. He said, all I wanted to do was stop the threat. I wasn't interested in, in killing people. It was not my intent. He, he knew what he was doing. He knew how to handle a gun. And the whole course of the, the whole force of the justice system from the president on down to the mainstream media calling him a vigilante, a white supremacist, uh, a militia man. I mean, this is what happens in our society when police are told to stand down, when no one is there to protect businesses. Police were nowhere around there. This guy, yeah, Rosenbaum, this. he was someone who was looking for trouble. He was. They were yelling, cranium him, but she means shoot him in the head. They were chasing him. They were trying to kill him with a skateboard. And the, the prosecution saying, oh, kill you with a skateboard. That deserves lethal, lethal force. Sure does. When you hold it like a baseball bat and you hit me in the head with it. I mean, come on. The now 18-year-old stands accused of intentionally murdering two people and trying to murder a third at a Black Lives Matter riot in August 2020 in Kenosha, Wisconsin. That riot took place in the wake of the lawful police-involved shooting of Jacob Blake, a man resisting arrest who pulled a knife on cops who was then shot seven times by an officer. Days later, then 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse went to Kenosha to protect the city from the planned riot, burning, and looting. He was given an AR-15 by a friend in Kenosha and was heard on tape saying he wanted to help act as a medic and to keep the peace. Chaos ensued, and Kyle shot three people. For over a year, the media has condemned this kid as a vigilante domestic terrorist who went on an unjustified killing spree. No open-mindedness to his claim of self-defense, nor the videotapes that clearly back that up, 
or to his story that he went to Kenosha that evening to stop the lawless behavior of others when police would not or could not. Here's a sample of that media coverage. Kyle Rittenhouse, the 17-year-old vigilante. Kyle Rittenhouse, the vigilante. Kyle Rittenhouse, the armed teenage vigilante. A 17-year-old vigilante, arguably a domestic terrorist, picked up a rifle, drove to a different state to shoot people. Kyle Rittenhouse, a guy who's deeply racist, went with weapons to a Black Lives Matter protest, looking to get in trouble. He did. He murdered a couple of people. Rittenhouse, uh, the 17-year-old kid, just running around, shooting and killing protesters. You see the 17-year-old who was radicalized by Trumpism, took his AR-15 to Kenosha and became a killer. A white, Trump-supporting, MAGA-loving, uh, Blue Lives Matter, social media uh, uh, partisan, 17 years old, picks up a gun, drives from one state to another with the intent to shoot people. A 17-year-old boy mm -hmm. who drove across st state lines with an AR-15 and started uh, shooting people up, including a guy with a skateboard. There's so much misinformation in that butted soundbite, I don't even know where to begin. Kyle Rittenhouse's former lawyer was on the show yesterday saying there will be libel lawsuits, more than one. So you have two sides, uh, obviously an incredibly hostile situation. You have cops that are, in my opinion, um, stoking the flames of that uh, hostile situation. And both sides are armed. Um, and it's a recipe for disaster. And then you add the Rosenbaum um, part of it. He was someone who was just released from a mental uh, health institution. Uh, he was clearly not in the right frame of mind. And honestly, his behavior is what really sparked the shootings uh, to take place. As I'm running, at first I'm in the sidewalk and Mr. Lakowski, um, Jason Lakowski is in the sidewalk and I stop to talk to Mr. Lakowski for a brief second. I remember telling him that I just shot somebody and I need help to get to the police because the crowd, there was a, not a crowd, a mob was chasing me. And did Mr. Lakowski offer you any help? I, I don't remember. Okay, what do you do then? I, I continue to run after hearing people say, people were saying cranium him, get him, kill him. It, people were screaming, and I just was trying to get to the police running down Sheridan Road. What I remember is running past Anthony Huber, and as I'm running past Mr. Huber, he's holding a skateboard like a baseball bat, and he swings it down, and I block it with my arm, trying to prevent it from hitting me, but it still hits me in the neck. Mr. Huber, immediately after I'm kicked in the face, runs up as I'm sitting up to try to get up and get to the police. I'm on my back and Mr. Huber runs up. He, as I'm getting up, he strikes me in the neck with his skateboard a second time. Then what happened? He grabs my gun and I can feel it pulling away from me and this, I can feel the strap starting to come off my, my body. And what do you do then? I fire one shot. Mr. Good morning. Everybody that you shot at that night, you intended to kill. Correct. I didn't intend to kill them. I intended to. I intended to stop the people who were attacking me by killing them. I did what I had to do to stop the person who was attacking me by killing them. Two of them passed away, but I stopped the threat from attacking me. By using deadly force. I used deadly force. That you knew was going to kill. I didn't know if it was going to kill them, but I, I, used the, I used deadly force to stop the threat that was attacking me. You intentionally used deadly force against Joseph Rosenbaum, correct? Yes. You intentionally used deadly force against the man who came and tried to kick you in the face, yes. correct? You intentionally used deadly force against Anthony Huber, correct? Yes. You intentionally used deadly force against Gage Grosskreutz, correct? Yes. Mr. Rosenbaum was chasing me. I pointed my gun at him, and that did not deter him. He could have ran away instead of trying to take my gun from me. But he kept chasing me. It didn't stop him. Mr. Rittenhouse, you're telling us that you felt 
like you were about to die, right? Yes. But when you point the gun at someone else, that's going to make them feel like they're about to die, right? That's what you wanted him to feel. No. You wanted him to get the message from you that if you come any closer, I'm going to kill you. That's why you pointed the gun at him, right? I pointed the gun at him to deter him from... I, I pointed the gun at him so he would stop chasing me. What was the risk to you of death or great bodily harm at the moment you killed Joseph Rosenbaum? If I would have let Mr. Rosenbaum take my firearm from me, he would have used it and killed me with it and probably killed more people if I would have let him get my gun. Mr. Rosenbaum never said anything to you about taking your gun, did he? He didn't say anything, but he tried to take my gun. And whoever's got that gun is a threat to everyone else? If, if he would have taken my gun, he would have used it against me. So look, these details matter because if you're going to make an argument that you acted in self-defense, there needs to be some proof that there was uh, an imminent threat. Now, what really mattered to me was how all of this unfolded. What was the thing that sparked it? What started all of it? And initially, I was under the assumption that Rittenhouse was the person who was chasing after Joseph Rosenbaum, that, that that's how it had started. But I was wrong about that. Okay, so I want to correct the record. I was, in fact, wrong about that. Now, of course, in order to use the defense of self-defense in a court of law, you need to show that there was a, an imminent threat, right? Uh, and in this case, with uh, Grosskreutz unholstering his weapon, uh, you could argue, obviously, that uh, Kyle Rittenhouse, who was on his back at the time, uh, was dealing with an imminent threat. When you were standing three to five feet from him with your arms up in the air, he never fired, right? Correct. It wasn't until you pointed your gun at him, advanced on him, with your gun, now your hands down, pointed at him, that he fired, right? Correct. So in the wake of that testimony, did the media or these know-it-all activists do any self-reflection? You tell me. LeBron James just tweeted out, quote, what tears? I didn't see one. Man, knock it off. That boy ate some lemon heads before walking into court. Good gracious, where's your humanity? Hakeem Jeffries, the head of the House Democratic Caucus, tweeted, lock up Kyle Rittenhouse and throw away the key. Do you know anything about law, about criminal law, anything at all? Have you bothered to look into it even a little? Have you followed the trial at all before you decided to make a public comment from that post? Disgusting, dishonest. And the natural product of what happens when the false ideological social justice crew meets actual fact-based courtroom justice where truth and fairness still matter. 